Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining APQC's webinar, Optimizing the Recruiting Process and Candidate Experience at Mercy Hospital Systems. As a reminder, audio is available through your computer speakers or dial-in lines, and all attendee lines are muted. This is the Q&A tool located on the right of your screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them here and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and you will receive a copy of the slides and the recording in a few days. And I would now like to pass the presentation off to the Human Capital Management Principal Research Lead, Alyssa Tucker. Well, welcome to our listeners. When it comes to recruiting, which is the topic of, of our webinar today, our members are, are commonly asking us um, kind of a set of questions. They're, they're asking, how can we reduce time to hire? How can we improve the, the candidate experience? How can technology and process improvement be leveraged to boost recruiter productivity and also provide a, a personalized and engaging uh, recruiting experience? So during today's webinar, we will hear how Mercy Hospital Systems has approached uh, these challenges. Our speaker today is Paul Kinsey. Paul is a talent selection leader at Mercy Hospitals. He has a decade of successful experience working in multiple interest industries in selecting the right talent into an organization. Paul is passionate in ensuring his team uses the best lean practices without sacrificing quality and staying up to date on trends within the market. A strong believer in keeping candidate experience at the forefront of the conversation, Paul always looks for ways to optimize our processes while trying to view them from the candidate's perspective. Paul prides himself on his partnership with hiring leaders and executives and has improved collaboration amongst talent selection and the departments they serve. So with that, welcome, Paul. Thank you, Alyssa. I appreciate it and happy uh, to be with all of you this morning and, and talk about this uh, past year. Obviously, it's been a, a very challenging year for, for every industry. Healthcare um, obviously uh, has shared in that burden and um, happy to share uh, some of what we uh, went through this past year um, that ultimately uh, assisted our pandemic efforts, but then long term um, has, has really help strengthen our talent selection team. So um, to get started, just a couple, a little bit about Mercy, who we are. Um, we're headquartered in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. Um, we, um, we were initially started in Dublin, Ireland. Um, there's a, a House of Mercy there that is still there today. That was founded by Catherine McCauley. Um, the Mercy system that we operate out of was established in 1986. Um, we have 40 hospitals spread out primarily across the Midwest, um, 900 uh, physician practices, a uh, total of around 45,000 coworkers and 2,400 physicians. Um, our, our primary footprint is Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma, but we also have some outreach clinics down south in uh, Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Um, as well. So a uh, couple notes before I, I hop in, um, just about myself. I started with Mercy in 2013, previous to Mercy. Um, I worked for an IT consulting firm uh, for uh, here in the St. Louis area, looking to bring IT candidates to companies uh, uh, within the region. Um, 2013, made the, the change to Mercy and um, started on the recruitment side uh, as our IT recruiter after a couple of years. Uh, began to manage the the St. Louis team um, and uh, that supported all of the hospitals in the area. Uh, and then uh, within the last couple of years, I've moved into a, a new ministry-based role uh, as the director of our talent selection innovation. And, and that innovation piece, really looking at our systems, our processes, our technologies, how can we optimize those, um, you know, make make it as efficient of a process possible. And um, so today, I wanted to walk you all through um, some of what we've gone through in the past year to, to optimize our systems. But um, before before I get to, to that, did want to talk a little bit about our traditional recruitment approach uh, coming in in 2013. And really until uh, early 2020, um, we operated off of a community-based model 
Uh, so we had our East community and uh, some of you on the call uh, probably define East a little differently, but that's our, our furthest East Metro, which would be the, Saint, the greater St. Louis area, uh, have six hospitals here in the area. Um, and then we had uh, our North Central, uh, so, sort of the Southern, uh, Southwest Missouri um, community, uh, South Central, Arkansas, and then West and, and Oklahoma. And, and really the approach um, that we had is we all, we were a shared service function. So we all reported to uh, the same uh, VP and operated off the same systems. Uh, but, it, but it really was a community-based approach where um, when I was managing in St. Louis, it was those recruiters. I had counterparts in each uh, community as well uh, to, to share best practices with and, and such. But um, some of what, you know, we saw is we had added so much uh, technology since uh, 2013. Uh, we had a, a new ATS uh, within a couple of years uh, of me starting at Mercy that we, we moved off the prior one, was much more out of the box, not much customization. Uh, we actually moved on to ISIMS at that point. Uh, but some of the other technology we had added across our ministry, uh, self-schedule and, and on-demand interview technology, so a vendor that fully integrated with our ATS, uh, where candidates could not only self-schedule uh, on a recruiter's calendar, but they also had the ability to go through an on-demand uh, interview with a fully recorded interview experience with the Mercy recruiter, which, which was important for us for um, some of those you think, you know, hospital 24 by seven, uh, some work overnight and sleep during the day. So it gave greater flexibility to go through that interview process. So we had added that on um, virtual career fairs. Uh, this, uh, this really ended up being huge with uh, the pandemic, having this technology already in place, but the ability to not have to go in person, but to host uh, career fairs and connect leaders and recruiters with candidates that were interested uh, in, in a new position. And then we also had added on a, a front end candidate experience that tied directly into our CRM. So when candidates are visiting our website and, and coming back, we're we're getting their digital fingerprint and we can serve up jobs based off their uh, search activity, uh, based off of their preferences, their skill set as well. Um, and then the helpful part of that too, uh, tying it into our CRM, we could actively re-campaign to, uh, to those applicants to um, after they leave our website. Uh, and then lastly, and, and we were on this really since 2013, but we had added uh, talent assessments across, I'd say 90 plus percent of our positions um, had, had a talent assessment as part of the interview process. And so um, so we really, we had all of this technology that we had added on, saw the benefit uh, of it, saw um, lots of return on investment, but overall with some of them, we, we struggle with adoption of, of every single technology and, and process uh, across our communities. There, were some regional inconsistent recruitment practices that um, that things had been done a certain way. And um, for instance, the the interview, the self schedule was was a big shift from uh, the, from previously recruiters that were in the hospital. And so we needed some greater adoption to that. And then also it was tough to um, tough to define every single role because we had some recruiters, some onboarding specialists that wore some different hats depending on community. We we're on the same processes, same uh, technologies, but some of the work was done a little bit differently across um, the, the regions. Uh, telecommuting opportunities, we moved to this uh, probably about three to four years ago um, where it was a hybrid model. We had some recruiters that would work from home two days a week, come into the office three days a week, uh, but, but we struggled a little bit with adoption in some of our rural communities where leaders were used to having the recruiters there um, you know, at their fingertips and um, work from home was, uh, was a bit of a, of a new thing to them. And so um, inconsistent requisition volume for recruiters, you know, we'd see, it would be hard to set that target uh, for uh, recruiters because we didn't know all the hats that they were wearing locally. 
Um, they would be involved in some more operational type projects, not, um, not just recruiting. So it was harder to set that target across the board for how many uh, requisitions we should shoot for for each area. And then that really ties into to recruiters covering multiple skill sets. Uh, we, we had some recruiters, especially in the, in the rural areas where you might have a little bit smaller of a hospital, two recruiters, you'd be recruiting for a nurse uh, in the morning, by the afternoon, you're looking for uh, anything from a transporter to a food service tech. And so it was a little different their day, uh, harder to get a little bit into a flow. Um, and then also, um, every skill set's a little different. Some need more proactive reach out as well. And so it ties back to that inconsistent requisition volume. We, we couldn't ultimately aim for uh, across the board um, requisition uh, loads. And then also university recruitment challenges. I mentioned I was in St. Louis. We struggled, for example, in St. Louis with sonography. Uh, not many schools in the area were graduating sonographers. Uh, what we learned is our South Central community had a great relationship with schools down in Arkansas, and there was a surplus of candidates to where they didn't have enough jobs and they were looking to relocate. And so that was extremely helpful to connect with them, but, but it really showed us that we had an opportunity to better uh, hone in on our university recruitment uh, approach by skill set. So really, as we looked at our recruit, uh, the future of our recruitment team, uh, a core group, four of us met um, down in Springfield back in February of 2020, looking at um, wh what's going to be the future. We wanted to look out not just next year, but, but the next five years. How can we transform the recruitment model and, and do better as a team? And our determination ultimately um, was to move to a telecommute model with a focus uh, on service lines rather than individual communities. So how can we connect up all of our recruiters and, and the skill sets they're recruiting on and, and have more of a ministry-based approach to recruitment than just a local approach to that? Uh, so we began to put together our change management plan. Uh, obviously, having recruiters, whether you're in St. Louis, Springfield, Oklahoma, Arkansas, having them go into either an office or a hospital every day working with a team, uh, that was a big change for our recruiters. So um, rather than just moving forward with it, we, we believed we needed to put together uh, a change management plan uh, for, for our recruiters, uh, for our HR partners, as I mentioned in some communities, uh, they were tied into more operational projects and uh, we needed to have that change management plan. So we were still connected with our HR partners, but we also um, were able to, to move forward with the new approach. Um, and then hiring leaders, this was, this was a big step, not just for hiring leaders, but even senior leaders that were used to walking down to the recruitment office. And you might have a recruiter sourcing for, for a nurse and expected to drop everything and um, you know, run up and do an interview or, um, or, or jump on, on another project. So um, was, was a big shift definitely for our hiring leaders. So our target for standardization was January 2021. We came out of that February meeting um, saying, let's, let's shoot for beginning of the calendar year um, due to some other initiatives we had. So at the same time, um, we were working on a new refreshed internal mobility website, uh, very much like uh, what I talked about earlier, the front end experience that our candidates had. Uh, we were still on the ATS experience for internal coworkers. So um, we, uh, we were moving forward with this internal mobility website where coworkers would have a profile, they could come back, um, it would serve up jobs, it would send them job alerts as well that um, had more functionality than, than our previous experience. Um, and we were also moving forward with a, um, both a new background check vendor and an I-9 solution um, that integrated uh, better with our ATS, more of a prime integration, less clicks, uh, but also we believe that our uh, turnaround time on our back checks would, would greaten uh, as well. So, so we had all these uh, projects that, um, that were going on um, and uh, the, the go lives for them were, uh, for all three were either July or August 
Um, so, so January 2021 is uh, is the plan. Then what happens? All of us know the pandemic hits. Uh, really hit our uh, our local communities hard in mid March. Remember speaking with my boss and seeing the numbers go up and talking about moving all of our recruiters off site um, and just to protect them and um, thought that that was the best. But um, some of what we what we saw going back to the telecommute piece um, is that some communities still relied on some paper processes. They hadn't fully uh, embraced uh, a, a partial hybrid work from home model. Um, so they had uh, some paperwork processes where there were some handoffs between recruiters, onboarding uh, and such. And then most uh, areas did not have a, an office set up at home either. We only had one community where we had uh, equipment at home where uh, not just the laptop, but uh, monitors and, and such to ensure they could be uh, productive. So that was a big barrier um, for our team. And then um, not only that, you know, as we're moving over to this uh, and having paper processes, we saw this is a great opportunity to go ahead and standardize for the, for, for the full team. Um, so, so ultimately we needed that centralized process and, and we needed it done yesterday. So um, we were fortunate in that uh, many of our um, requisitions that were not considered critical for pandemic efforts uh, went on hold or were canceled for the interim. So our team normally operated about 24 to 2,800 openings. Uh, we went from 2,600 openings to 1,000 pretty much overnight. Uh, and so that definitely helped where uh, some of that communication across teams that had more paperwork heavy processes, they started reaching out to the communities that were a little bit further along with those processes um, and uh, started sharing best practices. And um, from a change management standpoint, that definitely helped, I would say, um, to, to set the, the framework for moving to the new approach. Um, so, so some of the standardization considerations as we were working on this, as I mentioned, we couldn't just do it overnight. We needed to plot it out. Um, see what the best approach was. Our talent selection group consisted of just over 100 individuals throughout our Mercy communities, many of them sitting at uh, local hospitals. And then there were some, uh, there was some sensitivity from each community. Uh, we, we have uh, a lot of recruiters and teams with great initiative and wanting to do better. And so there were a lot of uh, processes in the way uh, things were done, that there was some sensitivity changing and feeling like we're moving to a Springfield model, we're moving to a St. Louis model. And so ultimately we wanted the buy-in from the teams to move to that next step uh, where they could, um, where they would not only embrace, but they would start to uh, effect, uh, effectively and efficiently uh, move candidates through the process and, and bring folks on board. Uh, so um, as we were putting together uh, our standardization, we, we did have to look some locally too, that uh, some local practices that needed to remain as part of the process for compliance. We had um, in some communities, state specific background checks that had to be done based on the type of position. If you were in a home care hospice type of role, if you were in a driving type of position, it wasn't a one size fits all approach. And then also uh, some of our offer letter verbiage um, had to be uh, taken into account with some of our communities for, for joint overall. And we wanted to ensure as we, we went to have a standardized process that we didn't miss any of those core pieces with those local communities that needed to be uh, ultimately uh, considered and, and put into the process. Um, so our hiring leaders also needed some communication and training on the new standardized approach. Um, they were used to working with one recruiter. Uh, many had that recruiter in the office. They'd stop down by their office and, and talk with them. And with the new approach, we knew that some leaders would move from one recruiter to two to three uh, and they could potentially uh, be across the ministry. So uh, an Arkansas leader might be speaking with an Oklahoma um, city recruiter. So, so we knew that we had to, to lay the, the framework to, to get them um, ready for that change as well. And then um, also um, as we moved off site, uh, our training program um, really in every community 
was more, you know, it was person to person, um, lots of um, kind of in-person trainings, sitting next to each other, working on the computer, allowing them to, to do that um, while someone was physically in the room with them. And we needed to move more to a virtual training program that, that was consistent, but also much like the point above um, with some of those uh, local practices, we needed to be able to flex to some of our differences in service lines. So um, our, our compensation team uh, was was really set up the same way that our recruitment was and that we had uh, different communities of compensation that th they were fairly consistent, but there were definitely some local practices that were different, some shift pay uh, and such. And so moving uh, new recruiters uh, or existing, even existing recruiters into the service line model, we needed it to take into account the compensation differences for, for instance, uh, a position in St. Louis to a position in Arkansas, some of those local practices. Um, interview practices, um, uh, depending on the area as well, um, had to look to standardize. It really ties into our fellowship hiring too. Um, had to, to consider um, what was different for each service line and, and needed to stay uh, different for a best practice. Uh, for instance, the, that fellowship hiring, we hire every, uh, we hire every uh, year, a couple times a year for fellowships where nurses are uh, graduating. So we might extend an offer in December uh, or January for a May grad that won't start until the June, July timeframe. So uh, due to compliance, we knew we couldn't immediately run the background check on those. And so we needed some, um, the, the, the core process, but we also needed an offshoot process for those type of uh, situations. So the new standardized approach. So we partnered uh, with our background check vendor for a full Lean Six Sigma review of all our processes. I, uh, the fall prior, uh, down, uh, in 2019, we, um, I, I was able to meet with the new background check vendor and talk about um, some of our challenges, um, not just from a background standpoint, but more at a high level as well. And I um, was fortunate to go to one of their conferences and had the opportunity to meet one of their VPs uh, that oversaw this area and just sat down, had lunch with him, talked with him about um, our challenges and he offered what their team was able to, to come in and do. And um, I, I knew at, at that point that it was something that we needed to, to consider and, and move forward with as we implemented the new background check. Um, thought that given some of the local sensitivity, it was important for a neutral party to come in and assist with, with that buy-in piece um, to, to bring uh, best practices and um, and, and really, we didn't want to just look in the mercy bubble either. We wanted to look holistically and have that outside vendor come in and provide any industry insights on best practices too. So um, was extremely helpful to, to partner with them. They were able to, to come in and to find every step um, of our four different areas, um, really using Lean Six Sigma, uh, principles. So we went out and charted each step in the process and who's responsible for that process, who's ultimately the one accountable for the process, uh, who might need to be consulted, checked with um, to ensure everything was okay with the hire, and then ultimately um, who needs to be informed uh, of the position because we didn't want to miss any piece. And um, it was a lot of work definitely to, to build that groundwork, um, but definitely uh, definitely helped as we uh, moved forward. Uh, so we uh, we partnered with them and they uh, were able to provide both swim lanes, process flows for each community. So we had it documented. And um, one of the, the, the ironic, uh, almost funny parts of going through that process is uh, we had a core group on it from each community. And where you thought things were a lot different, you started to see patterns where we were doing all of the same steps, but it might just be a little bit different in the process or someone with a different hat might be completing that piece of the process. Um, so from a change management side, that definitely helped as well uh, to have them partnered together to understand the different processes uh, throughout the communities. 
So once we were, uh, all of those were compiled, uh, we did find efficiencies from each community. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't one size uh, approach from one community that was being forced on, on others, but we were able to take a look and see uh, efficiencies from each and um, build that into the process. Um, and then from there, uh, that two week training program, the virtual program uh, was developed internally. Uh, I don't speak much to the training program after this, but uh, I will mention uh, we we had, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about our volume as it went up, but we had the ability um, to go through that training with right at 25 new individuals once our volume picked up. Um, and this uh, spring, we were able to reach out, find out some feedback on um, how the training went, uh, opportunities for improvement, what would have helped looking back, um, and then also rating the training on a one to 10 scale. And um, we definitely had some things to, to add in that, that would be helpful, some timing um, and refreshers and such. Um, but, but the training um, came up with just, uh, it was like 9.3 stars out of 10. So we were, we were very happy with, uh, you know, feeling that we were training individuals to be ready after two weeks to, to come in and, uh, and ultimately be effective. And some of the approach too is not only did we have that two week training where uh, they would go through that core curriculum, they would also go through some training with their service line to understand a little bit more about those practices, uh, partner with our compensation group. Uh, but then our lead trainer, uh, we would have daily huddles uh, that uh, second week and then partially into the third week as well to touch base at the end of the day, what's going well, wh where are you uh, potentially having barriers, and then to, to reinforce that training. So the new approach, so what were some of the benefits as we looked to roll this out to the team? So um, an individualized approach to requisition load. So no requisition is the same, especially across service lines. Um, as I show what service lines we ended up um, moving forward with, for instance, a nurse is completely different than a transporter to a, a senior executive position. And so we wanted to take into account best practices for volume by service line rather than a one size fits all approach across the board. Um, and then really, uh, we moved from having recruiters work on multiple skill sets to, to really having specialists that were subject matter experts that um, that knew the best places to go and recruit and were able to build pipelines better as well uh, as a team. Also, um, consistent practices uh, and increased knowledge sharing between the communities. Um, going through the Lean Six Sigma approach definitely helped to uh, to increase that knowledge sharing and, and learning what was working well, but then, um, but then we'd have consistent practices um, across all of our team, um, across each community. Um, and then um, a scalable uh, solution as business needs change, we, we have that target, uh, you know, Rex per recruiter and a, as volume goes up in one area, we have the opportunity to A, either um, increase, uh, Bring, bring a recruiter from another service line that their volume might be down uh, for a time or, or B, uh, bring on uh, either PRN help or if it's going to be a long-term need, uh, bring on another full-time recruiter. So um, was very scalable as well. Um, and then I, I talked to the university relations challenge uh, with the sonographers earlier, really every single area benefited from this uh, because now we were able to build out that university based um, approach by service line and we knew for sonographers for RNs for each area what uh, universities were, were graduating students build those connections within that service line and then the ability to hire the best recruiters from from all over the US uh, I myself I have someone reporting to me who is in Massachusetts, um, another in New York. Um, I have one in Hawaii um, as well. And uh, throughout our teams, uh, while, while we're the Midwest, we're truly spread out through California, uh, Texas, and, and, and really all over the US and, and able to bring in folks that 
um, fit into our organization well and support uh, that culture that we have, but then also uh, are at the top uh, at top level of uh, of selecting. So our service lines, these are the service lines that we ended up uh, moving forward with. Um, so most of them pretty obvious, um, you know, nursing and, and clinics, what type of recruitment um, one would do. Our, our non-clinical support services focused on our um, entry level positions at uh, all of the local hospitals. So those transporters, environmental um, service technicians, our food service techs, uh, the receptionist uh, that might be checking folks in. Um, the clinical support services was, was a bit similar, but more on the clinical side, more uh, in general entry level, uh, but also um, but also would work hands-on with patients, whether it be a patient care associate, a, a surgical tech um, and such. Um, and then our allied health were more of those specialty type of positions within the hospital, your uh, physical therapists, sonographers, ultrasound technologists. In general, though, that service line we looked for, uh, for better university relations since most of them had to have a certain certification or education. And then our ministry of transformation and virtual. So this is, this is my area um, right here while I work with every area. Um, I have a recruitment arm of it that um, some recruiters that will recruit for business, IT, finance, HR, uh, virtual care, really all of those uh, um, shared service support type roles. Uh, but then the second arm is that innovation arm, um, which um, I have an innovation manager that I partner extremely closely with who um, primarily put together that training program um, also, she works very closely with me with all of our technologies and processes, building out those process flows as well. Um, so very, very important part of having this service line virtually, having that in place, um, have a talent selection business partner, very focused on data. I'll talk about some of the initiatives that, that we have toward the end uh, that she's working on, but um, someone who's very skilled and, and looking at data, seeing trends and um, help to, to advise to make uh, decisions. And then we have a talent selection administrator. This is really um, a support role uh, that uh, monitors uh, our recruitment feedback mailbox, um, also um, handles our call-in line as well. If an internal or an external has uh, difficulties completing an application, um, so that rolls up to us as well. And then I'm very excited about uh, we recently added an employment brand manager. We had someone in place who wore many hats previously and did uh, much of our website development and many of our campaigns and such. Um, but we we wanted to uh, centralize this a little bit more and so have someone whose entire job was focused on that employment branding. So very excited to, to get that off the ground um, as well. Um, and then we had our providers, uh, the doctors and nurse practitioners, the executive level roles are anything from C-level executives to, to VPs. Um, and then we felt it was important for an onboarding service line. How could we centralize our onboarding function uh, across the area where um, you might be in Oklahoma, but you're able to hire a Springfield coworker and bring them through that um, process as well. Um, so all service lines were formed and trained by June. Uh, we put a pause on all of our requisitions uh, that weren't mission, mission critical. As I mentioned uh, earlier, we went down from that 2,400 to 1,000. Uh, if you fast forward to July, our team's the busiest we had ever been. Um, unfortunately, due to some of the pandemic challenges, uh, we had some restructuring and furloughs. And so we all of a sudden went from 1,000 requisitions to over 3,700 within a, a four week time. And we were with 25% less staff. So um, you, you've heard the expression, it's hard to, to start a, a cold engine. Um, it uh, definitely relates to recruitment as well. Uh, when, when things are paused, uh, getting that, um, that candidate flow back. And so, um, so our team was very stretched at that point. Um, what we can do, um, we flexed some from, from my service line specifically. Our shared services were 
were a little bit slower. It was the clinical uh, area where we had the need. So we were able to flex some over to assist. And then we also began uh, training uh, new PRN recruiters on our new approach at that point. Um, as I mentioned, some are realigned to help support critical efforts um, as well. So, um, and at, at the same time, we had some ministry task force, uh, task forces uh, form to uh, begin looking at what we identified as our eight critical positions to help support uh, pandemic efforts. So um, below, um, I have a listing. Um, those were the roles that uh, were the most urgent and uh, needed the most attention, not that other areas didn't or, or weren't busy, uh, but for us to support the pandemic, these were some of the core areas that were identified by senior leadership that we needed to focus on. So we uh, were able to create special advertising campaigns uh, to generate further interest. Uh, we look to uh, take away any potential barriers. Is there anything slowing up the uh, recruitment process? How can we uh, continue to be more lean? Uh, and then really more than anything, building those applicant uh, funnels and, and pipelines. How can we um, how can we generate as much interest as possible that, that are qualified and, and would fit into our culture? So we created a uh, fast track onboarding experience for uh, those eight critical roles. Um, where the normal onboarding time, we were able to uh, minimize that for those core areas and bring coworkers in faster to get them trained up and, and ready, uh, ready to go. Also, we uh, created, uh, we worked with our data analytics team uh, to create a dashboard for our senior leadership so they had access to see progress on each critical area. Um, I have the template down below of what it looks like. Uh, but those are our eight critical positions. Um, we'd look at active headcount starting within the next two weeks, um, starting outside of that, any offers and progress hires. And uh, the neat thing, the way that they built this is um, you could look at that at a high level or you could uh, ultimately go down by uh, community as well, a specific hospital to see how you were trending. Um, so, um, so ultimately, you know, wanted to kind of talk about. So we we moved to the new, um, the new approach. Um, you know, since then, and um, at that point, we were all on the same um, the same process. Wanted to talk through a couple of our key initiatives since then. To um, that, you know, we we started here, but we wanted to also continue that journey. How can we continue to improve? And um, so wanted to talk through some of our key initiatives um, since we went on to the new uh, process. So our fiscal year runs July to June. Um, requisitions, we've been busier uh, than ever this year. Our team's on pace to fill over 17,000 positions this year, 40% uh, more than last year. Um, so very, very hectic pace, um, but very proud of the work that each team's put into that. Um, with our new centralized onboarding process, um, our onboarding time has gone from 11 business days down to seven. Um, for our fast track um, hires, now we're doing a six day turnaround, very close to bringing, uh, our goal ultimately is a five business day turnaround time. Um, but depending on the week, if you know we're bringing in two to 300 individuals who wanna ensure that we have the appropriate um, support uh, for that. So cautiously, uh, you know, it seems like every month moving down a day. Um, so um, very proud of that progress as well. Um, I would say we, we definitely have had better communication throughout our team. Uh, we also, we always had a good communication at that local level and then those local leaders would get together for uh, meetings um, bi-weekly, but we've moved now more to uh, leadership huddles, service line leadership huddles, um, where where we meet as a core leadership team, and then we bring that information right after to each of our service lines. Um, we have innovation hours weekly to look at how can we continue to get better as a group. Um, what are some additional areas um, of efficiency that, where we can take out some manual work? Um, also have uh, monthly talent selection knowledge shares, um, which has been uh, very helpful to connect the teams, especially in that uh, most being 
used to going into the office, seeing other recruiters and, and such, those local recruiters, you might be on different teams now, but, but you're able to keep that relationship open by those monthly uh, talent selection knowledge shares. And they connect outside of that as well, but just a good opportunity for us all to come together. Um, and then our senior recruiters from our service lines, we, we have a, a monthly meeting as well that's led where special projects our senior recruiters can work on and um, they can bring up innovation ideas as well. But um, just a way, um, you know, we're very, um, you know, aware that, uh, you know, we moved off of four uh, communities previously. Now we have more service lines, but truly believe our communication is better as a result with, with these different huddles and, and meetings that we've added. Um, and then uh, some ATS en enhancements has come uh, through that as well. We've standardized our e email templates across the ministry, those offer templates. Uh, we had many personal ones created before, didn't necessarily get updated as we had updates that needed to be added. So standardized our email templates across the ministry. Um, we streamlined that onboarding portal ministry-wide. That's the big reason we've been able to move down to the seven day turnaround time. Uh, but looked at what's the core that each coworker needs to go through, and then by community, what are some of the local uh, items that need to be completed as well. And then we've been able to remove a lot of manual posting work within our ATS. So, some things I think that we really take for granted, uh, the same thing that we do every time we post a requisition, you know, filling out a box, uh, we're tying a category to it, a talent assessment. Uh, we've been able to look holistically um, by service line and tie those at, at a job template level rather than the actual requisition. So each time a new requisition is completed uh, and created, that's already filled out and takes out that manual work for the team. Um, some of our other key initiatives, um, I talked about our on-demand interviews um, earlier. It's, it's a great experience where Again, you're a nurse, you're working overnight, you're sleeping during the day, you have the ability to fill out some text questions initially um, that are more pre-screen. And then we have a culture assessment um, interview that, that all go through and they have the ability to dial in their uh, phone number and it calls them and it's that Mercy recruiter on the other side. So we had, uh, I believe three templates uh, before the service line approach. Uh, early this year, we asked for feedback on, on the program, how it's working. And some of the feedback we received is we like to ask some more specific questions by um, service line, um, you know, a, a RN position versus a pharmacy position versus a patient care associate. There might be some different questions to ask. So, um, so we, we revamped our templates and um, we added a uh, a template for each service line so they could get more specific into some of the things they might need answered um, via text or uh, on-demand phone. Um, and then we began a video interview self-schedule pilot for our hiring leaders. So the ability for our hiring leaders to have candidates self-schedule on, uh, on their calendar and then that to be a like a WebEx type interview where um, they, they can have that video as well. So um, I included some of our utilization below um, as well. So um, as you can see, uh, that dip down in May and then a steady increase ever since then. I'm happy to share our team uh, last year uh, completed just over 32,000 interviews. Um, the average time to schedule and complete, very good, very good turnaround. Um, so we've been very, very happy with us and we have processes in place if uh, a candidate doesn't complete an interview where we're proactively reaching out to offer a uh, live phone interview with a recruiter. Um, a couple other key initiatives, we hired over 100 hospital support hires for pandemic efforts. Our, our nurses would have to come out of patients' rooms, take off all their PPE to get a glass of water to bring in. And we uh, created a runner type of positions where they could uh, bring that, that glass of water and, and save the nurse the, the 20 minutes that it took. And then ramped up our vaccination clinics very quickly um, as well. Our eight critical positions, um, I think really the last thing that I'll um, highlight um, as far as key initiatives, uh, the talent selection business partner that I referred to previously, um, she did a, a data deep dive into our 
uh, eight critical roles. And we looked back two years at our applicant pipelines, our advertising spend, and any barriers within the process. And my goal um, for, for a long time has been um, to, to build out uh, a programmatic advertising strategy. And, and we've, uh, we have started with programmatic last year. Um, but, but my goal was to utilize Mercy data and not just industry data. Uh, each community within Mercy is very different. Um, you know, some are um, more, more individuals in, in the city and then some are, are more rural areas. So I um, wanted to, to build it out um, where it made more sense given the number of positions we have. Um, and then ultimately um, uh, it helped to provide some further education uh, to each service line on their target candidates. So you're an R, looking for an RN, you're looking for an MA specifically. How many candidates does it take to ultimately get to one hire? How many at each step of the process need to apply, need to be interviewed, sent to the leader, offered and ultimately hired? Um, and then as a result, when you're looking at that much uh, data, you can see some additional process improvements and opportunities for, for further standardization uh, among our teams. Um, so the framework, um, and I won't go too, too far into this, but we looked into three different core areas, looked at the, the, the demand and the supply of candidates, ultimately that exchange, what happened within our ATS, um, but then also looked at a high level into our attraction, um, to the, and down to the evaluation, the interviews, the assessments that we had ultimately to, um, the offer hire and onboarding process. And then. Um, and then we were able to develop some standardized metrics that worked for all eight critical roles um, that, um, that we're starting to uh, create and, and uh, monitor, but then also application pipelines, as I mentioned um, previously, and really the application pipelines, we, we focused on this area right here from ineligible applications all the way down to, to hire to, to take a look. So, um, and really, it was more of a pipeline approach um, than, than a dashboard. A dashboard is a, a, a specific point in time um, when you run data. We wanted to look back to the initial need to ultimately build that out. So um, I know we're running short on time here. So just a couple, um, couple last points. Um, moving from that traditional to a service line approach did not come without bumps. Um, I spoke to acclimating hiring leaders to the new approach definitely was, um, you know, was a challenge at times. Um, also getting buy-in from all recruiters on the benefits of it. Uh, the pandemic and moving virtual definitely helped on that side, but um, there was still some uh, buy-in that, that we had to get from, from those two key areas. Um, truly do believe um, that our team would not have been able to manage the level of uh, requisitions and, and volume that we received last year without this uh, approach, knowing, you know, at what point do we bring on another PRN recruiter? Um, and then I, I think ultimately the, the efficient approach to um, what without having that across the board, um, believe that it would have been much more of a challenge. Um, as our volume continues to stabilize, um, it, this isn't a sprint. This is a, a marathon. We want to continue to find opportunities for, for best practices moving forward. Um, and then uh, ultimately, just I do believe uh, our team is set up for, for long-term success uh, with this new model. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to continue to building on what, uh, what we've begun. So um, that was everything I had uh, today. Um, Alyssa or Madison, I don't know if. Sure, and uh, thank you so much, Paul. I, I really appreciate that you shared your whole journey um, so people could see where you started and, and how you progressed along the way to where you are today. And, and also thank you for sharing the level of detail that you did about how you, you know, accomplished all these different steps to, to get to where you are now. I know that is very helpful um, to our audience. So I'd like to invite our audience um, to please submit any questions that you have for Paul, and I'll be happy to, to facilitate uh, a Q&A session. Um, Paul, I do have some questions that I wanted to get started with. Um, we often get a lot of questions around making decisions about technologies. Um, and so I wanted to see if you had any advice for listeners 
um, about things to think about when you're selecting specific recruiting technologies, but even also which vendors uh, to go with. Sure. Yeah, no, happy to to take that. And I think um, for myself personally, having previously been a recruiter is helpful. Um, now I'm I'm a little bit more removed from the work, so I believe it's all always extremely helpful to have a, a small group of um, good change recruiters that, that are open to change, uh, that can take a look and see um, how does this, um, you know, how would this work with uh, our current process where we get uh, efficiencies from that. Um, I sit on demos um, really one to two probably a week, always looking to see what else we could uh, we could bring in and one of my primary focuses is always is this another system where we're going to click log in search um, or how can we integrate this ultimately into our ATS experience where um, where it doesn't seem like a burden where it's something that might help um, but um, without a, a, a solid integration um, ultimately you know ensuring that we're not adding more clicks, more roadblocks to the application. How can it most easily be uh, implemented and adopted? Great. Um, another question we get a lot um, is, you know, what are the key performance metrics that I should be watching for, you know, different human capital management processes? And one we get asked about a lot is recruiting. What are the most important measures to be tracking for your recruiting process? And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on on that for you. What Are there certain sure. measures that you find critical for you? Sure. Yeah, we, um, so, so yes, definitely you know, we do have some, uh, we have a report weekly that we come out with. We call it internally here our Go Green report. And it takes a look at how quickly uh, we're reviewing candidates. Uh, obviously, healthcare is a very competitive uh, market. And so speed uh, to, to get to candidates that are highly coveted is, is huge. And so we, we look at that, um, how long is it taking us to review an application and either interview or send it to the hiring leader. Um, our goal as a group is a maximum of uh, two days. Um, and we average um, across the entire group uh, right at one day. Everyone, and it, it was a challenge when we started about three, four years ago with this Go Green report. And it was a challenge initially to, to change that mindset for recruiters. Um, but, um, but now it's very consistent where it's just part of the job that, you know, you're reviewing applications every morning and most review by the end of the day as well um, to, to get to that speed. And we, we do track um, days to fill too. Um, Mercy being a faith-based ministry, um, I'll, I'll mention it's not the end all be all, the days to fill. It's very important to us that we have the right fit for the position and um, not just hiring someone to, to fill a position and, and hit some number. So um, we're, we're very intentional about who we do bring on, but, but we do track the, the days to fill and um, really, really everything in the process. I'm very, very data driven, like to look at our CPAs um, and our cost per click as well. So um, a lot of KPIs that we've been able to uh, integrate into our process. Great, and I'm wondering also if you could just talk briefly about um, any tips for keeping the candidate experience, you know, central when you're making these kinds of recruitment process improvements. Um, you know, any ways, tips for understanding, you know, what the candidate wants or needs. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think communication is huge. Um, you know, we have really tried to move to a more transparent uh, model. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, making decisions quickly on whether to move forward um, in the process. But not only that, if we're not moving forward uh, within 72 hours, it's our goal to let the candidate know, um, hopefully, uh, you know, invite them back to the website if, if the uh, position they applied for is not the best fit um, as well. But, um, you know, do believe that candidate transparency, that's uh, the way the, the the market's moved here for, for a while. So, um, that's that's a huge piece for us as well. Great, and I just had had one last question um, for you. Um, 
you mentioned um, that you're able to have recruiters from anywhere now. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you had any thoughts or any tips on, you know, how to keep um, like diverse, uh, dis excuse me, dispersed um, recruiting teams um, connected and how to kind of keep that culture. If, if you've developed anything, we get asked about that a lot right now with, you know, the trends yeah, that are sure. going on with remote work. So I thought if you had any any thoughts on that to share. Sure. So, so I'll say when we were in the office and everyone was in the same location, our huddles were 15 minutes long and, and that's really more of a huddle. Um, but uh, it's what we've looked at with teams spread out. It's also an opportunity for us to connect. You don't, you're not able to walk past someone's office and connect with them. So um, our huddles are normally about 30 minutes um, to, to 45 and it's not just all information. Some of it's just catching up with a team um you know we uh my team specifically um you know has, has talked about you know personal goals as well um you know being uh in, you know in shape and diets uh, has come up a lot and so we've actually started a uh walk and talk uh, every monday at noon for our team and so we have to be a little bit more intentional uh about timing due to having a recruiter you know in hawaii so um so we have monday walk and talks where we connect as a team um as well and um, i know all of our service lines do different sort of um um you know whether it be a virtual happy hour or um some sort of a team building activity um something you know as small as a two truths and a lie especially if you've never worked in person with the individual yeah. you, you learn a lot about them and, and what they're interested in and some of the things they've done mm -hmm. That's great. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that. And just thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience and your expertise today. We really appreciate it. And I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Madison, who will close out the webinar for us. Yes, thank you so much, Paul, for joining us today. And I just want to remind the audience on a few things. Um, you will receive a copy of the slides and the recording in a few days, and we have provided some additional resources from APQC's resource library that relate to today's topic. And if you have any additional questions, please contact Alyssa. If you haven't already, check out our Human Capital Management Expertise page. We keep this updated with recent related resources, connect with us on social, and thank you for joining. I hope you have a great day. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you.